This lecture will be continuing the topic, how do stars shine? In this video, you're going to cover the colour of stars in their spectra. This video will be presented by Dr. John T. Horner. Welcome to the fourth video in our topic about how stars shine and how the universe works. In this short lecture, we'll be talking about the colour of stars and what we can learn from looking at their spectra and just introducing a few concepts which we'll then use in the fifth and final of the videos in this topic. The first thing I'm going to introduce here is the concept of black body radiation, which you will briefly remember, potentially, from topic one, when Dr. Angstelman was talking about the different kind of lights that can be used when we were explaining how a street light works. In particular, there was a discussion of your normal filament light bulbs, the traditional old style of light bulbs, where tungsten filament gets very hot. And the advantage of light bulbs like this is that the light they radiate is of all wavelengths, rather than the mercury or sodium lights, which only give light off at very specific, unique frequencies. This kind of radiation, where light is given off at all different frequencies at once, is known as black body radiation. And it's given off by any object that's radiating purely through heat, rather than because the atoms in the object are excited and their electrons are moving around. So, in the case of black body radiation then, there are many examples in day-to-day -day life, and slightly less day-to-day -day life, with which you're probably familiar, where the colour of an object that is hot can give you an idea about its temperature. So the example I'm going to use here, show you, is an example of what's known as a pahoehoe lava flow, which is very common on the Hawaiian Islands. So here's a beautiful picture of that kind of lava. The first thing that's very obvious here is that the lava is obviously topped by a cold crust where it's cooled down and solidified. But the lava pouring out from the end and peeking out from the sides of this cold crust is glowing with a reddy or yellowy light. And the hotter areas are brighter yellow, the cooler areas are reddy and orangey where they're cooling down. You can see the surface as this lava slowly flows, cooling and getting redder rather than yellower. The temperature of this kind of lava is between about 1,000 to 1,200 degrees centigrade. And even the black areas where it's just cooled on top are still probably very, very hot, but they're nowhere near as hot as the parts that are glowing, and they're giving off most of their radiation in the infrared, so they look dark to you. You'd see the same kind of thing if you looked at the coals or the logs in a fire. If you've ever seen a blacksmith working a piece of metal, maybe creating a sword, you'll have seen that as the metal gets hotter and hotter, the colour goes from being a dull red to a brighter orange to a yellow, and if they got it really hot, maybe even to a bluish time colour. And this is again black body radiation. As you get hotter and hotter, the frequency at which you radiate the most light gets bluer and bluer, and so the bluer something is, the hotter it is. Here's a figure that illustrates that schematically. As you can see from the figure, what, you're, what you can see in the figure is how the intensity of light, the amount of light that's been radiated, varies as a function of colour for a black body emitter. And you can see that whatever the temperature of the emitter, it radiates some of its light at every single frequency. But that radiation, that, but there is very little radiation at very blue wavelengths. There is a peak in the radiation and the location of that peak, the point at which you get the most radiation emitted, moves to bluer and bluer wavelengths as the temperature increases. The other thing that's interesting is that you increase, as you increase the temperature, the amount of radiation given off at every single frequency will increase as the source gives off more light. So as you increase the temperature, the source will become brighter and will become bluer. Now stars actually shine like black bodies. For all their big balls of plasma, the light coming from their visible surface has been bounced around inside the star, absorbed and re-emitted so many times that when it leaves the surface of the star, radiation comes out at all possible wavelengths, at all possible frequencies. So, that radiation from the stars is coming out at all wavelengths, at all frequencies, and therefore at all colours. But for every star, there will be a peak luminosity, a peak amount of radiation given off that will occur at a given colour. And from that colour, we can work out what the surface temperature of that star is. Hotter stars will be bluer, cooler stars will be redder. 
a star like our Sun has a surface temperature of around 6,000 degrees Kelvin and appears to be very yellow. A more massive star than our Sun would be somewhat hotter, typically, and may have a temperature of 10,000 or even 20,000 degrees Kelvin and therefore be white or blue. A star cooler than our Sun would be redder than our Sun, so you might have an orange star or a red star. And so by looking at the colour of a star, you can tell the temperature of the surface of the star. Now the star's a gaseous, amorphous thing. It doesn't really have a solid surface. So it's hard to say what that surface temperature corresponds to. But essentially, the deeper you go into the star, the denser the gas is. And you eventually reach a point where any light that is radiated will be reabsorbed by some gas. As you get higher and higher in the star, you eventually, therefore, come to a point where the light will not be reabsorbed and can carry on out into space. And it's at that point we call the surface of the star. It's a bit like the cloud tops on a planet. You have gas above the cloud tops, but it's fairly transparent. But once you hit the clouds, they're opaque. For stars that are in the prime of their life, which is 99.99% .99 of their lifetime, that's the time they're burning hydrogen in their cores. For those stars, the most massive stars are the most luminous, but they're also the hottest. So if you see stars that are in the prime of their life, if they're blue, they're much more massive than if they're yellow. If they're yellow, they're more massive than if they're red. So the most massive stars are the bluest, the least massive stars are the reddest. The one confusion to that scenario is that when stars come towards the end of their lives, they puff up. Their outer layers swell up so much that our sun will swell from being about one million kilometers across to potentially spanning the whole of the Earth's orbit. will increase in size by over a factor of 100. Again, from our relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature, you can see that if you greatly increase the volume of the outer layers of a star, they'll cool down. And so that phase in a star's life is known as the red giant or the red supergiant phase, depending on how massive the star is. Now, at that time in a star's life, it's more luminous than it was when it was in the prime of its life, but it's swelled up enormously, so the outer layers have cooled. So then you get a very luminous red star. And so if you look at the picture of Orion we showed in the very first of these little videos, the red star at the top left-hand corner is a star called Betelgeuse. And that is a very evolved red supergiant star. It's a very old star. It's very, very luminous, but it's swelled up to the size of Jupiter's orbit, five times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And that means it's very cool and very red. So typically, the red stars you see in the night sky are not low mass stars that are very nearby, but instead they're very old stars that are very luminous because they're almost at the time where they'll go through their death throes. The red stars you see in the night sky will probably all die within the next few million years, which sounds like a long time, but in terms of a star's lifetime, it's a very, very short period in its life. Now, if we look back at topic one again, we spoke about the mercury and sodium lights. And when we spoke about those, we talked about how they radiate light at only very specific frequencies. So the sodium light looks yellow because it radiates most of its energy at two very specific frequencies at around 550, 560 nanometers. The mercury light looks blue or bluey purplish because a lot of the radiation it gives off are at very specific frequencies in the blue and the purple region. This is known as an emission spectrum. Earlier on in this topic, I spoke about the hydrogen gas that was excited by nearby stars, glowing with a very pinkish reddish light at the hydrogen alpha wavelength, which is 656 nanometers. And once again, that's gas that's excited and is radiating only at one specific frequency. Every single element, every single molecule that you can imagine has its own special fingerprint. A set of very specific frequencies, or wavelengths if you prefer to think in wavelength rather than frequency, at which the atom or molecule will radiate if something happens to excite it. In the case of our mercury and sodium light bulbs, there is a vapour through which an electric charge is passed that excites the atoms and they radiate at their specific wavelengths. In terms of the hydrogen gas in space, there's ultraviolet radiation exciting those hydrogen atoms from nearby stars that causes them to radiate at their specific wavelengths. So if we put the light from a source through a prism and it's radiating in this way, we'll get a mission spectrum. We'll get a series of bright lines which are all located at very specific wavelengths and those lines will be the perfect fingerprint for the element or the molecule that we're looking at. 
Here's a figure where the bottom four plots show the emission spectra of a number of different species, and you can read off from them which species they are. The top spectrum of those four, um, the top spectrum of those four is a hydrogen spectrum, and you can see the very clear, very bright red line. That's a hydrogen alpha light that's radiated by the pinkish nebulae, which I showed you earlier on in the lecture. But you can see that every single species has its own collection of bright lines. If you instead take white light, light that has all colours at once, and shine it through a gas of a particular molecule or a particular atom, that gas will only absorb light at the specific frequencies at which it would radiate light if it was excited. What that means is that if you have the spectrum of a black body, an object like a star, which is effectively radiating at all frequencies at once, and that light passes through a gas, you'll get a series of lines that are black lines where light has been absorbed that again gives you the fingerprint of the gas through which that light is passing. And the example at the top of the figure here is an image of the sun's spectrum. Light from the sun that's been passed through a prism and broken up into its constituent colours, and you can see series of dark lines across that spectrum. These are called the Fraunhofer lines, and they give you the fingerprint of the different elements that are contained in the sun's outer atmosphere. So above the visible surface of the star, the thing where we talked about the temperature earlier on, there is much less dense gas, much more rarefied, through which that light shines. And so if we look at the spectrum of the star, we can see the spectral fingerprints of the gases that make up this rarefied atmosphere in the spectrum of that star. And these are the dark lines that we saw in the previous spectrum. What this means is that we can learn about the constituents of a star, what stars are made from. And this is how we know the amount of hydrogen, the amount of helium, and so on and so forth in the Sun and in other stars. We can use this tool to look at how different stars have slightly different compositions. Stars that form near the very birth of the universe have much less of the heavy elements, everything more massive than helium, because at the birth of the universe, the universe consisted almost entirely of hydrogen and helium gas and very little of anything else. Over the billions of years that have passed since, the heavier elements, such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, the iron at the centre of the Earth, all of the things that make you you, have been cooked in the nuclear furnaces in the centres of stars, and when those stars have died, they've been spread out into the universe and incorporated into the next generation of stars. So stars that have been born more recently have more of these heavy elements in them, because there are more of them around to begin with. And we can see that, and we can use this as an independent way of working out how old stars are. This is also, incidentally, how we discovered the element of helium. Now, helium on Earth is incredibly rare. Um, it's one of the reasons that people are talking about going exploring the moon with manned exploration again, because we think there may be more helium on the moon buried in the rocks than there is on the Earth. Helium so rare that makes mining the moon seem almost viable. Helium on Earth is so rare that people hadn't come across it until they started looking at spectra of the Sun, and they found dark lines in the solar spectrum that did not correspond to any of the known elements or compounds at that time. And it turned out that this was a new gas, something called helium, and it was called helium after Helios, one of the ancient gods of the Sun, in honour of the fact that it was first discovered by looking at the spectrum of our star. So that brings to an end the fourth video, where we've discussed the different composition of stars and how we can learn about them by looking at the light that they emit. In the fifth video, we're going to go one step further and bring in a reminder of the Doppler effect and tell you how we use that to work out how stars move within the galaxy and how here at the University of New South Wales, we're searching for planets around other stars. Special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming and editing this video. Also thanks to these people who provided images with a Creative Commons license that we made use of.